Hey, good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the Cyanids Management Board meeting. Uh, my name is Chris Batsavage. I'm the Administrative Proxy for North Carolina, and I'll be serving as chair. We'll start off uh, the meeting uh, with the approval of the agenda. Um, one uh, addition that uh, we'll make to the agenda is uh, uh, Erica Burgess will be updating the board on rule changes and new management approaches for Red Drum in Florida. Are there any any other um, changes or additions to the agenda? Okay, if not, then we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, next uh, will be approval of the proceedings from the May 2022 board meeting. Are there any edits or changes to uh, those proceedings? Seeing none, uh, those are approved. Uh, next up is uh, public comment. Uh, this is an opportunity for the public to provide um, comment on any items uh, related to the signage board that that aren't on the agenda uh, today. Um, we have a fairly light audience in the in in person, but uh, I'll just pause to see if there's anyone online that would like to make a uh, public comment. Okay, uh, no public comments, so we will uh, move on to the uh, the main parts of the agenda, and uh, we'll start that off by uh, the review of the traffic light analysis for Spot and Atlantic Croker, and I believe Spot is up first, and uh, uh, Harry Rickabaugh from Maryland will be giving that presentation. So, Harry, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So I'll be giving uh, the first part of the presentation, which will be the impacts on the data availability we had in both 2020 and 2021. I will then go over the spot traffic light analysis for 2022 that uses data through the 2021 fishing year. After that, then Dawn will take over our Atlantic Croker TC chair, and she will do the 2020 traffic light analysis for Atlantic Croker, which is also used data through the 2021 fishing year. Next slide, please. So our, our main, uh, one of the main things we're missing is the CHESMAP index. Uh, that survey had a vessel change and other uh, gear and uh, method changes in following the 2028 fishing season. So data through 2029, or from 2029 through 2021 um, is currently not available because they have not yet done the calibrations. They have a minimum number of side-by-side -side tows they want to do. They're actually still doing them. So they're going to have a really good uh, comparison toad data set uh, that they wanted to build before doing their comparisons and back calculate the old index to match the new index they'll be using moving forward. Uh, so we don't unfortunately have that data for the past three years and that is used in the mid-Atlantic for both the adult abundance index and as part of the uh, juvenile index for both species. I believe I know this for spot. I believe both species juvenile, definitely both species for adult. Um, we do expect that to be available, uh, at least they expect to have that calibration available early to mid next year, so we're hoping by this time next year we will have all three of those years then available again, including 2022. So this is not, unlike some of our pandemic-related uh, deficiencies, this will be data we'll get back. We just don't currently have uh, the index to be able to calculate the traffic light analysis. So uh, some of the other surveys were interrupted. These are mainly pandemic related. Uh, the Northeast Fishery Science Center bottom trawl survey was not conducted in 2020. So for both species, we're using a proxy value, which is the average of 2019, 2018, excuse me, 2019 and 2021. So it's a three year average. Um, once we get 2022, we'll probably average that one in as well, or the TC can decide if they have a better method for a proxy value, but that's what we're using for now. CMAP was not conducted at all in 2020 or in spring of 2021. So we are missing uh, the adult abundance indices for both 2020 and 2021 for CMAP. That's used in the south region uh, for both species as well. So we have some missing data uh, for both species in both regions. Several state service had some minor surveys had some minor impacts. Uh, probably the Biggest one, one we use the most, is the North Carolina 195 survey. It did operate in 2020 and 2021, but 
uh, due to limitations from the pandemic, they could not do their more offshore, more or less sites, like in the sounds, they had to stay closer, so basically in river sites. There was some impact to uh, certain areas were not sampled. So there's likely some bias in that, which will be discussed later. Uh, and the end of 2020 was affected to some degree, it varies by state, of course. We, we reviewed that before. 2021 data is um, not affected. Next slide, please. So then I'll, I'm now going to go into just a spot traffic light. As I mentioned, Don will go to over Croker later. Just as a reminder, management action was tripped in 2020, which the regulations went in place in 2021. Addendum 3 requires that those management actions stay in place until 2023. So this would be the first year, the evaluation we're going right now, that would have any uh, opportunity to relax regulations, and that would be for the 2023 fishing year. Okay, next slide, please. So just a real quick, uh, we've gone over these many times before, but in case there's anyone else or anyone on the board and or online who has not seen these before, the traffic lake for both species is split into two regions, the Mid-Atlantic region and the South Atlantic. The Mid-Atlantic is from Virginia North, the South Atlantic is from North Carolina South. Uh, both traffic light analysis use what's called, we're referring to as a harvest composite, which uses the recreational and commercial harvest data. And then there's also an adult abundance uh, composite, and that uses fishery independent indices. And we, uh, for spot, we use H1 plus. We split those indices out, removing any H0 fish. And then we also use some uh, auxiliary information, which I'll go over later, but those are the two parts that uh, mainly would trigger management action. I see a lot of these figures today. Um, what you see here, uh, this is for the harvest comp composite for spot. The top graph is the, for the mid Atlantic. Uh, again, as a refresher, we have two thresholds. One is the 0.3% red. So if the red bars on the bottom exceed 30%, um, at that point, we're considered to be in the low uh, concern or moderate concern, I should say, level. And for spot, if two of the terminal three years are in that level, management action needs to be taken. That's where we were when we back in 2021. As you can see, 2018 and 2019 were both above that 30% threshold. Once management action is tripped, um, these composite index aren't used to then trip further management at a higher level, which would be that 60%. If um, two of the terminal three years for spot were over that, we would then go into a higher level of management action, which is prescribed in the addendum. So it'd be more significant than we have in place now. But again, the commercial wouldn't be used because we put regulations in place that should artificially increase portion of red since this is based on harvest we are restricting harvest and just as a note only 0.21 would be affected in this particular figure by those regulations um, so for the spot the mid-atlantic as you can see has seen a, some improvement in the proportion of red it's still over 20 percent but it is under that 30 percent threshold the past two years the south atlantic however has remained high with Values above 50% for the past four years, but has remained just below that 60% threshold for the past three years. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, Mid-Atlantic Composite for the adult indices. And again, uh, take a close look at that top one. You'll see it only goes through 2018, because again, we're missing Chesmat from 2019 forward. So we can't really do a composite index. Um, uh, at this point, we don't have any of the terminal three years in that figure. Uh, the TC did look at the available data we had, which in this case is the North East Fishery Science Center Ferry Trawl Survey. And as you can see, it's actually shown an improvement. It's all green in the terminal three years, but again, 2020 is an imputed data point. It's not an actual value, it's an average. Um, so we really don't know what 2020 was. And as you can see in the graph above, C map, or I'm sorry, CHESMAP was the um, main contributor of the red value in the terminal years. We were seeing a difference in the inshore surveys versus the offshore surveys. And you know, in the absence of having CHESMAP, we don't really know what our proportion of red is, as we would suspect. Or at least in the past, that's where the highest proportion of red came from, and we're missing those data points at this point in time. Uh, so for now, we're considering the, the adult abundance 
metric is unknown because we are missing that chess map data point. We aren't making a determination of where the uh, abundance is based on uh, just the one index. Next slide, please. So this is the same sort of uh, look, but for the South Atlantic. One note, if you uh, happen to look at your, your um, report that was in supplemental materials, unfortunately, right after that came out, I was putting this presentation together and we noticed there was a mistake in this South Atlantic composite, which again, only runs through 2019. We're not really using that to evaluate management since we're missing two terminal years, but the proportions of red were too loud. It was accidentally, there was an error in that. We just didn't catch it in time. Unfortunately, I apologize for that. But the figure on your screen is correct. So for the South Atlantic, again, 2019 would be the only one that falls in our terminal three years. The proportion of red was under 30%. As you can see previously, it was above. But we do not have the last two years data because we're missing CMAP in this one. Um, in the absence of CMAP, we have the North Carolina Department of Marine Fisheries Program 195, and this again is for H1 plus fish only. Uh, you can see it also was below the 30% threshold of red for the last two years, but is red, it's not green. And again, when you start to see green, that's when you're at or above the long-term mean. So all these, this survey has remained below the long-term mean for the previous six years. Um, next slide, please. So some of the auxiliary information we look at, those are the two pieces we would use for triggering management. And, and I should have mentioned on the previous one, like the Mid-Atlantic, we're considering the South Atlantic. Adult abundance metric is unknown as well since we're missing CMAP. Uh, some of the auxiliary information we have is shrimp trawl bycatch. Uh, we don't use this for triggering, but we do track it to see if there's any uh, shifts in that trend. These are estimates um, based on effort, which you'll see on the left, so that's shrimp trawl effort. And on the right is the actual estimate of the discards in millions of fish. So uh, you'll see it's pretty variable at kind of a somewhat stable level lately. There was a spike there in 2019. This index does also use CMAP as a tuning index, and CMAP had high values in that particular year, so that was partially what bumped that up. Uh, but you can see the effort was pretty flat between 2020 and 2021, as the estimate was as well. Next slide, please. So for juvenile indices, we again split these north to south. Uh, both north and south for spot utilize uh, CHESMAP in the north as an A0 and CMAP in the south. Uh, there's two indices in this one, but obviously since we're missing those, I did not present them uh, since they've been missing for multiple years now. Um, so what we have here on the top is the Mid-Atlantic. This is only the Maryland SANE survey. And um, as you can see, there actually was an increase above the mean the past two years. In the South Atlantic, the North Carolina Department of Marine Fisheries Program 195, um, it shows proportions of red. So those two uh, regions seem to be disagreeing. Um, and you can see in the past, the 2017-18 was the opposite. It doesn't seem like we're getting good recruitment in both regions at the same time. We're getting average to below average for an extended period now. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the data limitations, the Program 195 didn't sample all sites. It, it had, uh, since it wasn't sampled in more open water sound sites, there could be a bias in one direction or another. Uh, I'm sure Don will probably touch on it, but for Croker, the, uh, the member from uh, North Carolina, just aside from our traffic light analysis, they did a, a, um, a memo to their own department on what those impacts may be. And for Croker, it was actually biased high. Uh, that same sort of analysis wasn't done for spots, so we don't know if utilization of, of that inshore versus so that riverine, I should say, versus the more sound areas um, is different for spot like it was for croaker, but it seemed like croaker were more abundant in the riverine sites that were sampled than they were in the, the more sound sites. But again, if that were true for spot, these would be overestimates, of course, if the reverse could be true since that analysis wasn't done directly for spot. Uh, next slide, please. So in general, looking at this table, uh, you'll see the last three years for each metric, what the percentage of red was. And uh, as you can see, unfortunately, we can, as I mentioned, we 
we can't use the harvest metric to increase, but we could use it as an indicator of improvement. Obviously, if we put regulations in place, you expect lower catches. If you had higher catches, you would assume that's a, a sign of, of more abundance or availability, I should say, of the fish to the fisheries. We aren't really seeing that, particularly in the South Atlantic, a moderate improvement in the Mid-Atlantic, but we're still in the red, so we're still below average. And um, But we are going to, it's hard to say with the South Atlantic how much of that is regulation driven, although there's very little change between 2020 and 2021. And we don't have the full complement of indices for either the South Atlantic or the Mid-Atlantic to make a determination based on the adult one or age one plus, I should say. Um, Abundant. So at this point, the TC is considering the traffic light analysis determination as unknown for both 2020 and 2021. Next slide, please. Up for spot, this would be, as I mentioned earlier in the year, that we could consider a regulation change in 2023 since the regulations have been in place for two years. The TC is recommending maintaining the current regulations in light of the adult abundance, abundance metrics being unknown, excuse me, and the fact that harvest levels have not shown a significant improvement. We also have seen uh, mixed results from or mixed ind indications from the uh, juvenile indices. There's not a lot of support for us to recommend relaxing those regulations at this point in time. We're also very hopeful that we have that CHESMAP time series next year and terminal year values for all the surveys, which will put us in a much better position to see where we are and make a more solid recommendation to the board. Next slide, please. Um, that's all I have for SPOT. Uh, if you have any questions regarding either the changes in the, or I should say the unavailability of indices for the SPOT traffic light itself, I'd be more happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Uh, any, any questions for Harry on the traffic light analysis for SPOT? Okay, hey, uh, if there's no questions, then uh, we'll uh, pass it over to Don Franco to give the uh, Croker traffic light analysis. So Don, whenever you're ready. Okay, sounds good. Good morning, everyone. Uh, what we'll talk about for Croker, as usual, is very similar to what you'll hear, what you just heard about spot. Um, big key things to keep in mind are the number of years for trigger mechanisms are different. So we have three out of the last four years for Atlantic Croker instead of two out of the last three, like you just heard for spot. And then also the regulations were set to be in place for three years instead of two years like spot had. And so those are the, the big key differences to remember going, going into the presentation. Um, and just uh, management triggered in 2020, same as same spot and regulations were put in place in 2021, and those measures cannot be relaxed. And uh, next slide, please. So again, we'll keep the same pattern here. We'll go with the harvest composites first. So that is recreational and commercial combined, just as a reminder. Uh, the first slide is uh, Mid-Atlantic and South Atlantic, both shown on the same slide. So for the Mid-Atlantic, we've actually been above 30% for the eighth year in a row and the past four years above 60%. And then the South Atlantic was also above 30% for the past eight years in a row, but with no years above 60%. So as Harry very eloquently just said earlier, uh, the last year we had management measures in place, so we would expect to see a little bit more red increase in that year for a, uh, you know, because we would expect that catches were declining because regulations were set in place. Um, and we do see that for both regions. And then uh, moving forward, 2021 data cannot be used to trigger elevated management response until the regulations are lifted. But if we saw improvement, that would be a good indicator that we could relax regulations. Uh, next slide, please. And then we'll move into the adult abundance composite indices. And for this one, we have separate slides for Mid-Atlantic and South Atlantic to address some of the um, missing data issues. So again, Mid-Atlantic uses CHESMAP, so it cannot be updated beyond 2018. So this is actually the same graphic that we've shown you um, the past couple of years at the top. Uh, but we do have a full data series for the Northeast Fishery Science Center 
minus the 2020 imputed data, of course. So we looked at just that one survey just to see some, some sort of updated information. And we see that the three out of the past four years were actually below the long-term mean with increases in abundance of about 32.5% in 2021. So based on just that one survey, it looks like we're trending at least in a good direction. And while it's possible that 2019 could have exceeded 60%, um, you know, if it was combined with another survey, it's unlikely that we had three out of the four previous years exceeding 60%, which is what we would need to say that we needed an elevated management response. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is the South Atlantic Ad Adult Abundance Composite. And again, we are missing CMAP data for 2020 and spring of 2021. So we cannot show an updated version of the composite beyond 2019. Uh, so this is what we presented last year, same as the Mid-Atlantic, but the composite hasn't exceeded 30% since 2010. And then if we look just at the one survey, the South Carolina Trammel Net, that's in the composite, uh, 2020 and 2021, we saw uh, increases, and then the red has been below 30% since 2017. So for this region, we're likely not even exceeding 30% threshold in previous three out of the four years. Okay, and next slide. And again, juvenile indices are not used for triggering uh, management measures, but we do track them and provide them as supplementary data. So we do use CHESMAP in the Mid-Atlantic Juvenile Abundance for Atlanta Croker. Um, so we cannot update that beyond 2018, but we can look at the other survey that's in the composite, which is the VIMS data. And um, so VIMS alone shows just the, the previous or the most recent two years, and we are seeing declining abundance in 2020 and 2021, and continued high red proportion is an indicator that there's poor recruitment in, in those years. So it's definitely something for us to keep an eye on moving forward. And then next slide, please. And then the South Atlantic Juvenile Abundance is actually not a composite. It is just the North Carolina Program 195 survey. And as stated earlier, not all stations were sampled in 2020 and 2021. And as Harry mentioned, there was a study that was completed that outlined that Atlanta Croker may actually be overrepresented and uh, has elevated magnitude in those years. So it's, there's a little bit of a bias um, for those years because they didn't sample all, all areas. And then, uh, but we only see red exceeded 60% in 2018 with the past three years above average. So even 2019, that was not affected at all, was still above the long-term mean. Which is all good indicators. Uh, next slide. Next, we have the South Atlantic Shrimp, Ball, <laughs> Shrimp Trawl Fishery Discards. And the figure on the left is the same as what you saw. The effort is exactly the same as we saw for spot. And then the discards are slightly different because it's different species. So, um, but the net fishing hours have been relatively low from 2020 until 2021, about pretty flat, same as the year before. And it's low compared to the rest of the time series as well. Um, and Harry pretty much covered everything that you would need to know as background data uh, for this, but uh, at least we're seeing a little bit of a downtrend in recent years. And next slide. So this is the summary table that we provide for you that tells you all of the percentages for all of the regions and all of the composites that are used in the trigger mechanism. So uh, just an, another reminder with regulation changes in effect in 2021, the trigger would be based solely on adult abundance starting in that year 2021 forward as long as regulations are put in place. But because Croker is three out of the last four years, we, we can still look at 2018 through 2020 for uh, making decisions. Um, but to pro propose any change, we would need to see, need to exceed 60% in three out of those four years for either region. So if we have status unknown for three out of the four years in the mid-Atlantic due to the data gaps, but we also see increases in abundance from the Northeast Fisheries Science Center survey in recent years, indicating that we shouldn't really expect to have triggered an elevated response in that region. And then two out of the four years in the South Atlantic for the adult abundance were mostly green, so no triggers were likely tripped there either. 
And then hopefully uh, by next year, we'll have all the data that we need to fill the gaps for Chess Map and be able to fill in those, those years and will no longer be unknown. We'll have a, a good idea of how everything is uh, going in the, in the mid-Atlantic region for the adult abundance. And then also we'll have CMAP, more CMAP years to help fill in any data gaps there. So with management uh, already in place and in place for a minimum of three years to begin in 2023, the TC recommends just maintaining the current management measures and no change is recommended. Uh, next slide. And that is all I have for you, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for the presentation, Don. Uh, any questions uh, for Don on the Croker traffic light analysis? Uh, yes, John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation, uh, Dawn and Harry. Just curious with Croker, I mean, they seem to have these long population cycles, but this time seems like the the down part of their population trend, this trough seems to be going on an extremely long time. Does that show up in the data? Is this a very long down period for the Croker, or is it pretty much typical to what you've seen in the past? Well, I feel like we're definitely seeing uh, we're seeing declines for the juvenile abundance. If we want to go back up uh, and look at the adult abundance, I feel like we're actually going in a, in a more positive direction for the adult abundance. But it's just that one survey that we were looking at in the juvenile composite for um, the Mid-Atlantic that's showing increasing proportion of red. So I'm hoping that we are actually getting more back on a on an upward trend in that cyclical pattern. But it does, yes, absolutely tend to go up and down. Um, but we will we will know more when we have all of the, the Chesmap data included. And we and in, in the packet, you'll see that there's a lot more information provided and we actually threw in some other surveys just to look at more information as much as we could possibly look at. And it seemed like all surveys were trending in a positive direction at least for the uh, adult abundance composite from, from memory. I don't remember exactly what all the juvenile um, composites said, but I believe it's only in the mid-Atlantic that we're seeing increased red proportion in, in recent years. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, th thanks, John. Yeah, it's a good, good question, definitely. Cyclical pattern uh, it has been around for a while for Croker and yeah, the the, trough has been pretty low. Hopefully it's trending in the right direction. Guess we'll find out in a couple of years. Uh, Roy Miller. Thank you, Chris. Uh, this question is either for Dawn or Harry. In the plots of uh, net hours fished in, in trawl fisheries uh, versus discards, did, did you plot um, discards per hour fished combine the two to see if there's a, a trend in that direction? Unfortunately, I don't, neither one of us put together that, that figure. Um, do we know if anyone from the ASMFC staff is in the room that could, that could answer that question? Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Hey, Don, this is Jeff, and I can I can jump, and I worked up those estimates on trim trawl discard estimates. We do have a table of the catch rates per year. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what that trend looks like uh, with just the catch rates alone, but we could provide that in future updates of these if that's of interest. I, th I thought it would be of interest to see whether the, the catch per unit effort has been going down. Obviously, um, the discards are going down, but I presume that's uh, in addition to bycatch devices, it's probably a reflection of net hours going down as well. So I was just curious what the catch per unit effort looked like. Thanks. Yeah, if you look at those trends, I mean, there is some definitely some similarities between the effort and the total discards. So from that alone, I would uh, suspect without having the data in front of me that the trend in CPUE is somewhat stable. Um, but yeah, we can definitely include those in, in future updates as an additional figure. 
Yeah, th thanks, Jeff. And uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for for the question, Roy. Um, yeah, so because any any additional information on kind of getting a better sense of the shrimp trial discard trends, I think would be be good. Uh, Pat Gear, just just following up on what Roy was saying. In a lot of the states in the southeast, the, the shrimp fishery, the number of licenses has been going a lot less vessels, so the effort is going down as well in that fishery. But that is a good point about looking at, you know, trawl hours. Uh, the other question I had about that was, um, is it the total effort for the year, Jeff, or for the um, the total shrimp effort for the year? Is that what that is? Yeah, that figure shows all of the shrimp trawler effort uh, across the South Atlantic. And, and is it the total landings for Croker and Spot that are compared to it in that one graph? No, that is estimated discards. So that would be the essentially okay. the catch rates that we were discussing applied to those net hours to expand it up to a total discard. Is con uh, seasonality considered in that at all? It is considered okay. in the models to estimate the discard rates. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, uh, Pat and Jeff. Any further questions uh, on, and actually, uh, e either either traffic light analysis or on Croker, but if there's any questions folks have on spot that they thought of, um, entertain those as well. Okay, uh, seeing no questions, uh, the the TC has recommended no no changes uh, to um, management for for either Spot or Croker, and Spot is up for consideration um, in, in 2023 with uh, you know, the, the the two years uh, in place with the traffic light. Croker is not, but um, as uh, both analyses uh, showed, uh, the status is, is largely unknown for for both until uh, until we get you know, the the surveys they rely on uh, back back full-time uh, hopefully that's going to be the case in 2022 so uh, that and with chess map data uh, available next year for the missing years uh, hopefully we'll have a, a little clear picture of uh, of the trends uh, traffic light analysis trends for, for both species and I guess we'll go from there so uh, unless there's a, 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 a urge by anyone to uh, make any changes based on what we have uh, I guess we'll just uh, see what next year brings. So, all right. Uh, appreciate uh, the, the presentations and, and, and the questions by the board. Um, we'll move on to the uh, to the next uh, agenda item, which is a re to review the development of a spatial model of spot abundance and mortality. And uh, Dr. Rob Latour uh, will be uh, updating the board on that work. So, Rob, whenever you're ready. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great, thanks. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. I'll, I'll try to be brief, because um, I know you have a lot to cover. Um, really just want to give you an overview of what Mike and I are thinking um, regarding developing a spatial model for SPOT. Um, there's a broader context here, which I'll get to right here in the next slide, so please go ahead. Um, Gosh, for probably two decades now or longer, there's been some broad interest um, in understanding effects of environmental drivers on fish and shellfish populations in the Bay. I'm thinking back to the late 90s for some technical reports promoting ecosystem-based fisheries management that's led to the fisheries ecosystem plan and subsequent uh, ecosystem modeling activities. But the reality is, in order to sort of understand those relationships, at the population level, we need bay-wide estimates for most of the species, and we really don't have those. Um, so we kind of are limited in terms of our ability to understand environmental impacts um, without estimates of abundance and, and survival as well. And so Mike and I, um, several years ago, approached NOAA Chesapeake Bay Office leadership with the idea of developing a framework for trying to develop these estimates for for a number of species um, where we, we have the ability to estimate bay, bay abundance as well as um, coastal abundance. And so that's really what I'm gonna talk about here briefly this morning is just to give you an overview of what we're thinking and, and, and our intention to apply it to SPOT. Next slide. 
So the goal or objectives is to develop a spatial model that gives us estimates of abundance and mortality rates for spot in the bay as well as in the coast. And the idea here is to take that information and then allow linkages to environmental drivers to understand how environmental impacts may be affecting population dynamics and ultimately make all of this information and methodology available to the public to facilitate additional research. I can imagine if you have a time series of abundance and mortality for a particular location that facilitates direct relationships and analyses with broad scale climate drivers or other policy um, type um, evaluations to understand responses of the of the populations and the community. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, this was you know a broader framework that Mike and I had in, had in mind. Um, we're grateful to NCBO for the support. An initial three-year project was kicked off two years ago, and in that project, we we suggested we could um, tackle two species. Um, NCBO reached out to other uh, management agencies, VMRC, Potomac River Fisheries Commission, Maryland DNR, possibly even outside of that domain, for ideas on which two species to select. And right out of the gate, as you might imagine, striped bass was number one. Um, so for the last couple of years, we've been working on that and we've made good progress. Late 21, early 22, we initiated the conversation for what would the second species be? And, and the feedback that came was converging on spot. And, and the reasoning was tied to a few things. One is spot represented forage species. So this would be a way to sort of provide some insight. Striped bass being the predator, spot being a prey, maybe there's um, some value added there. Um, as you all know, there's no currently accepted assessment for spot. And so perhaps some of our work can help facilitate and enhance um, TC activities as they move forward in the coming year with their um, assessment activities. And so our goal here is to, to develop this analytical pro, uh, product in concert with the TC, but not in a sense of um, uh, competing or duplicating it, it, anything that the TC might do when it comes to their assessment activities. So it's really our, our intention is to have a value added enhancement that hopefully will, will facilitate um, good discussion and possibly you know, uh, improvements for the assessment model that they bring forward to peer review. Uh, next slide. So real briefly, just you know, give you a sense of, of the structure. We're, we're thinking of an age structured model, spatial, statistical catch at age, so pretty pretty standard thing here with the, with the nuance being um, this will be spatially explicit. We'll keep track of two populations in two areas, use all the available survey data and catch data that would normally go into the assessment. Um, but a benefit here is both Mike and I have graduate students who are will be working on the project, and my student um, is just beginning her PhD, and she's interested in tackling some of these um, uh, objectives that may not may, that the TC may not have time to to address, to be honest. So, you know, habitat modeling using the survey data, investigating questions about potential shif shifting of distributions or habitat utilization. Um, patterns in responses to environmental drivers on broad scales. And really, she wants to focus heavily on a management strategy evaluation simulation um, component. So uh, possibly evaluating in a management strategy context, the traffic light or any other harvest policies or control rules that the TC and, and you all as the board might want to consider. So these are some of the value added um, concepts that we're thinking that may enhance the TC's activities. Next slide. Um, kind of in a picture uh, sense, if you imagine on the top row here, the, the box being the coastal zone, and then the bottom row, the box being the bay, and the timeline on the bottom, sort of beginning in late fall when spawning occurs and running through the spring, summer, and, and subsequent fall, wrapping around to the following year. Spotted offshore spawners, so we have the po coastal population that would that would produce recruits that would come into the estuary or the bay, kind of an early spring. Some of those coastal fish will, will remain on the coast and survive. Some of them will immigrate into the bay for some seasonal residency over the warmer months and then emigrate out in the fall to um, the coastal zone for spawning activity. So the, 
the two populations we're talking about are the, is a coastal population and a bay population that are seasonal, at least in the bay. And the two areas are the coast and the bay. So it's a two box model keeping track of um, spot in both areas with the idea of estimating abundance in those areas and survival. And, and inherently, of course, we'll, we'll need understanding of movement. Um, next slide. Um, this, is, this is all familiar to you. I'm just noting here that our goal is to use all the available catch data that would normally go into an assessment. So the commercial catch at age, the recreational catch at age, MREP, and, and some attention certainly for estimating discards, which I know has been a challenge in the past. This is not an exhaustive list of the indices. And incidentally, I'm the PI of CHESMAP, and I promise you all, and I'm apologizing, I feel really bad that we haven't been able to get our calibration work um, completed. COVID and some other challenges have, have delayed that process, but we will have um, the time series of the calibration done and everything will be up through 2022 for you all next year. Um, any other surveys that I may be missing that the spot that the spot TC will consider certainly will be in in our discussions as well. So we want to parallel the the data sources as best we can. And so that next slide, um, a little bit on the estimated products. Um, we hope to estimate recruitment in each area and abundance in each area in the first year. Get a handle on fishing intensity in each area and selectivity for each of the fisheries. Survey catchabilities and selectivity as well. And then the, the most kind of interesting thing might be um, understanding movement that describes, you know, the proportion of the overall population that is in each area during each time step. What this means is um, our time step will be uh, sub-year, maybe quarterly. Um, we haven't figured that out yet because we haven't really um, gotten going on this one. Um, but but we will be looking at the data through a different lens at a much um, finer time scale and much finer spatial scale. So we hope to glean some ideas about movement into the estuary and out of the estuary and along the coast, um, uh, you know, if, 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 if possible. Um, and last slide, or next slide, I guess. Um, so next steps um, really are to submit data requests. Um, this may seem simple, but the reality is because of um, the need to have a very fine temporal and spatial resolution to some of the fishery dependent data, um, we're very mindful of, of confidentiality issues and non-disclosure type things. So we're working through that process to make sure that we're in compliance. Um, and early indications are, are that we think we can get the data at the level that we need, but, but we do need to be careful about um, confidentiality. And then, you know, to begin developing the model, um, we have a great deal of infrastructure in place because the, the striped bass model has been um, been working on for a couple of years. So initially, it'll be similar to the striped bass model, and then tailored to spot given spots' life history being different than that of striped bass. And then my last slide is just to acknowledge um, Mandy at, at NCBO and Tracy for linking us up today, and anticipated thanks to her for. Um, future relationship uh, management with Spot TC, and of course Harry and the Spot TC. Um, we look forward to working with you all closely, and funding from NOAA Chesapeake Bay Office uh, with contributions from Vins and CBL. Um, so that's all I had. It's just a really brief overview. I'd be happy to take any questions if there's time. Thanks again for the opportunity to speak this morning. Thanks, Rob. Uh, pr appreciate the the update on this uh, this work. Uh, any any questions for Rob? Uh, John. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Rob. I'm just curious, you had a management strategy evaluation. Um, our management of spot is pretty simple at this point. Do you see like area specific management in the Chesapeake as a result of this or uh, what, what type of results do you see from a management standpoint? Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, we my thought initially is to to approach this. What would you like to do as the management board? Um, I know you've been under some constraints and there's been some limitations, but given a simulation analysis, you know it opens up the door for whatever ideas that you may want to consider. So I don't want to have any of my preconceived ideas in, implemented without consultation with those to make sure that they're in the realm of possibility. So I think this would be 
the objectives of the MSC would be defined based on conversations with you all, SPOT TC members, any other um, constituents that have interest. And so that's really an open, open question at the moment. Um, certainly we could start with evaluating the traffic light approach um, since that's the current, current approach in, in place. But if there are other harvest policies or strategies, area-based or not, um, we're certainly open to those and, and happy to consider those in our, in our evaluation. Hope it's a little bit um, ambiguous there. Hopefully that addresses your question. Now, yeah, yeah th thanks for, for that, Rob. Appreciate it. Uh, Lynn Fegley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Rob, for the presentation. This is really a, a little bit in response to John Clark's question. We were highly encouraging um, of this effort to take on SPOT um as the species were being discussed and spot is a very hot button issue um in maryland i think it probably is in virginia too we have a lot of differing uses for these fish from you know the being used as live line and a commercial harvest and recreational um and it's always it's a controversial fish in maryland so and we um could really use this information so i, I think this um exercise, this analysis is going to be extremely helpful, at least just within our state as we move um, forward. Yeah. Thanks, Lynn. I appreciate the support. Um, on my slide with um, estimated parameters, um, you'll notice that there's no discussion of reference points. Um, and I just want to emphasize and underscore that we do not view this as a competing or alternative assessment model. It's more of an enhancement um, to whatever the SPOT TC develops as an assessment model um, to fill in gaps if there are gaps or to just provide a, you know, a broader understanding of the resource population dynamics. So um, just want to emphasize that we're, we're not trying to compete or provide an alternative uh, model for the, for the TC. Yeah, th thanks, Rob. Uh, Roy Miller. Thank you, Chris. Rob, I've always been kind of curious whether there's a linkage between uh, Delaware Bay spot populations and croaker populations and Chesapeake Bay populations. Uh, I've just wondered if if um, you're similarly curious about that and if if you would ever consider um, accessing readily available data sources for Delaware Bay and maybe the coastal bays of mm -hmm. uh, from Delaware and Maryland for um, in the case of Delaware Bay, adult uh, abundance as determined by trawl surveys, as well as juvenile abundance uh, determined in smaller trawl surveys. Um, that those data sources are readily available, as you probably know, and, and it might be interesting to see if there is a correlation between those populations. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for this project, I don't anticipate going beyond two spatial areas just because of the challenge of estimating movement. Um, but I have another student who is supported also by NCBO who's been working on building habitat models for a number of species, including the cyanids, um, spot and croaker. And one component of her work is to try to understand if the levels of exchange or immigration emigration out of the chesapeake how those how those have um, played out over time so patterns in the relative exchange from coast to bay over time and we've also accessed delaware day delaware bay data to look at the same question there and interestingly what we see for almost all the species in the bay is a decline in the s in the exchange if you will that is the the relative abundance of the bay compared to the coast um, is going down over time from 2008 through 18. Um, but yet in Delaware Bay, it's remaining stable for most every species or possibly um, in, in a couple of cases increasing. So the idea here is, you know, the sort of indirectly evaluate potential species distributions, but how those species that may be changing their distributions are utilizing estuaries. And the story is not so positive for Chesapeake, but maybe um, status quo, if not slight improvements for Delaware. So I don't know if that answers your question directly. I don't anticipate um, a spatial model that 
in this in this project here this morning that we're talking about involving all of the estuaries um, getting beyond two boxes or two regions is going to be probably beyond the scope of what we can do but but there are some other things happening that are trying to evaluate the relative um, roles of the of the major estuaries on the coast great thanks Rob uh, any uh, additional questions uh, Tom Foti Oh, since New Jersey sits there on part of Delaware Bay, it always was interesting to me what comes through the canal and the, the transfer of stuff that comes from the Chesapeake Bay into the, the Delaware Bay. I mean, we did some of that work on striped bass to see what the mingling. And when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this. This is what we should be doing for management tools. I mean, we try to do that with Long Island Sound when it came to the TOG. And we've basically been looking for a Tatog thing to New Jersey because we never have the money to do that to look like we can manage it in regions specific. And maybe this is where a good time that we should be looking at. If you're going to do this research, how do you tie it into management? How maybe they can start managing the species a little differently in the bays than they do in the ocean because of the abundance or the lack of abundance. And I think it would be... And a wasted effort in some ways if we didn't include that into the the, the study because you're spending a lot of money, you might as well get all you can out of the books you're spending and try to accomplish a couple of more things. That's just the way I feel when I look at these studies. Yeah, thank you for that, Tom. Um, I think the entry point for that would be the management strategy evaluation I mentioned. Um, if area management is on your mind as a board, we're certainly open to considering that in the simulation. Anything else that's on your mind, we're open to considering. So, so I think that's what gets me excited about doing this is these are value-added things that can can enhance the management and, and the understanding of the resource for the assessment. So, um, I guess I would just say we'll probably be having a more detailed conversation about that, you know, in the near future as we get into the spot model, but in the meantime, be thinking about um, possible management policies that that are of interest to you so that, um, you know, we can come up with a set that satisfies um, what it is that you're, you know, to be able to provide you with some some quantitative evaluations of these different strategies and potential trade-offs um, to equip you with more tools. So stay tuned, I guess. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, Chris McDonough. Yeah, Rob, thanks. That was, was very interesting. Um, I have a question on whether or not you guys are going to look at um, or incorporate environmental trends in the model beyond, I know you showed your, your figure with the seasonal, you know, seasonal transi transitions, a lot of which is environmentally driven, um, going between inshore and offshore, um, or is that more of a question for, you know, since you're just really looking at the bay initially, is that kind of too fine a scale at that point? Um, just in terms of how it's affecting population trends, because we have seen you know, what we think are changes, range expansion, and those other things that are occurring. And just wondering if that, if some component of that is being considered in the model. Yeah, at the moment, um, I don't know, I don't think we will have formal relationship with environmental parameters as part of the structure. I guess we'll wait and see, because that could emerge um, if there's relationships that are, that become well established. But I would, I will say that some of the parameters that we estimate will inherently reflect pressures from the environment and so indirectly we may be able to uncover um, some of those relationships or, or establish um, relationships and with different parameters that we haven't really thought about um, so i can see sort of this facilitating kind of an indirect um, look at where the role of environment and and if the relationship is strong enough, sure, we could include it as a structural component. Um, the movement analysis is going to be challenging, um, given that we don't have, um, or we'll have to rely on fishery dependent data to do that. Um, possible, but but um, you know, initially we're going to focus on just keeping it as simple as we can. Great, thanks. Um, Okay, uh, I guess before we move on, this final question I have, Rob, and I might have missed this in the presentation. Uh, what is the anticipated um, 
time that you think this uh, this uh, model will be done and uh, what terminal year of data are you planning on using uh, in the model? Right, um, I mentioned it was a three-year project. We've just completed year two. And so we hope to be um, spinning up spot here very shortly. We're, we're a bit intentional. We'd like to kind of track with the TC's activities as they work on developing their assessment. So in theory, you know, I, a year from now, we should have, you know, a lot more to say. Um, I can't guarantee that we'll be able to get it done in a year. It might might spill over in a little bit longer, um, but we're hoping to kind of parallel the process of the TC as they deliberate next year and and move to peer review. Um, that's the that's the goal at this point. Right, thanks. Are you looking to use data? Oh. 2022 or uh, yeah yeah sorry um the terminal year will we will rely on the tc for that because data acquisition is a challenge it's a lot of work to put, to put all the data sets together so another value added or benefit will be how the tc decides their terminal year um we will probably um or undoubtedly follow uh you know whatever they decide as well yeah makes makes sense all right great thanks uh just one last check to see if there's any additional questions Okay, yeah, thanks again, Rob. Yeah, I look forward to, to um, your, your work on this. Um, so, all right, I'll move on to the next uh, item on the agenda, and that's to consider Atlantic Croker and Red Drum Fishery Management Plan Reviews and State Compliance Reports for the 2021 fishing year. So, uh, Tracy, uh, whenever, whenever you're ready. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, in the interest of time, I will briefly go over the Red Drum and Atlantic Croker Fishery Management Plan reviews, um, but obviously more detail can be found in the FMP review reports and for Atlantic Croker specifically in the traffic light analysis report. Next slide, please. So I will start off with Red Drum and looking specifically at total landings for Red Drum, this figure breaks down the northern, which is New Jersey to North Carolina, and southern, which is South Carolina to Florida regions, commercial and recreational landings as the proportion of total coastwide landings. In this figure, starting at the bottom, the bottom blue and green represent the proportion of total coastwide landings that are from the northern region, and that dark blue at the top is the proportion of total landings from the southern region. In 2021, 55% of the total landings came from the southern region, where the fishery is exclusively recreational, and 45% from the northern region. And this is very similar to 2020, when the split was 55% of the total landings came from the southern region and 44% from the northern region. And these splits are a significant change from the 2019 and really 2018 to regional landing split, where um, approximately 20% were from the northern region and 80% from the southern region. Next slide, please. So I will now uh, review the Red Drum recreational landing specifically. In this figure, the blue bars are recreational landings in millions of pounds from the northern region, and the green portion is the recreational landings from the southern region. In the northern region, recreational landings were estimated to be 2.6 million pounds in 2021 which was only a slight increase from the previous year's estimates of recreational harvest at 2.5 million pounds. North Carolina was estimated to have the most recreational landings in the northern region, followed by Virginia. And of note, Virginia's red drum recreational landings increased by 84% from the previous year. In the southern region, recreational landings were estimated to be 3.4 million pounds in 2021, um, very similar to 2020 estimates, which were 3.3 million pounds. Florida is estimated to have the most pounds of recreational landings in 2021, followed by Georgia. Next slide, please. Yep. These two figures show the recreational total removals by region with northern removals on the top and southern on the bottom. Uh, both figures show the number of fish landed, which is green in the northern region figure and red in the southern region figure, and the estimated dead discards, which is blue in the northern region figure and orange in the southern region figure in 10,000s of fish. So in the northern region, the number of fish landed in the recreational fishery was uh, nearly 600,000 fish, which was down 13% from 2020. Uh, it's estimated that 8% of the released fish die as a result of being caught, 
which gives us an estimated of a little over 300,000 dead discards in 2021. Recreational removals from the northern region are thus estimated to be around 890,000 fish in 2021. In the southern region, the number of fish landed in the recreational fishery was 1.2 million fish, which was a 15% increase from 2020. With the estimated 8% dead discard rate, there is an estimated of uh, 590,000 dead discards in 2021. So recreational total removals from the southern region are thus estimated to be 1.8 million fish in 2021. So in both regions, about one third of all removals in 2021 uh, were estimated to be comprised of dead discards. Next slide, please. So this figure shows the total removals compared to the number of fish released in both the northern and southern regions. The purple bars are uh, total removals and the red line is releases both in the northern region and the maroon bars are total removals and the orange line is releases in the southern region. This is all in millions of fish. So in 2021, 3.8 million fish were released in the northern region compared to the estimated total harvest plus dead discards of 890,000 fish. The number of releases last year in the northern region was similar to 2019 and 2020, varying between 3.6 and 3.8 million fish. The number of fish released in the southern region last year increased by 40% from 5.3 in million in 2020 to 7.4 million in 2021. This is compared to the 1.8 million fish in total removed from the southern region in 2021. Next slide, please. So very, very briefly, I just wanted to touch on and note that at the July meeting, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission approved new management regions and regulation changes for red drum in state waters. Um, the rule changes are shown in the slide, but Erica is gonna go into further detail about these changes at the end on, under other business. Next slide, please. So for the PRT recommendations, the PRT found no inconsistencies among states with regard to the FMP requirements. Uh, both New Jersey and Delaware requested de minimis status through the annual reporting process. As a reminder, while Amendment 2 does not include a specific method to determine whether a state qualifies for de minimis, the PRT has chosen to evaluate an individual state's contribution to the fishery by comparing the two-year average of total landings of the state to that of the management unit. New Jersey and Delaware each harvested approximately 0% of the two-year average of total landings. Uh, and as another reminder, de minimis status does not exempt either state from any requirement, but it may exempt them from future management measures implemented through addenda to amendment two as determined by the board. And lastly, for Red Drum, uh, research and monitoring recommendations can be found in the FMP review document. They didn't change too much from last year, um, except for the recently completed Red Drum simulation assessment and peer review report that has some recommendations. All right, next slide, please. Uh, I will now go over the Atlantic Croker FMP review. So we'll first look at the Atlantic Croker landings. In this figure, the black line is commercial landings and the red dashed line is recreational landings, both in millions of pounds. So total Atlantic Croker harvest from New Jersey through the east coast of Florida in 2021 is estimated at 3 million pounds, which is a 39% decrease from 2020. The commercial fishery harvested 32% of the 2021 total, and the recreational fishery harvested 68% of the 2021 total. And this was uh, fairly similar to 2020 when the recreational fishery also harvested a majority of the total Atlantic croaker harvest. And this represents a large shift in the previous 10 year average split from 2010 to 2019 of approximately equal um, split between commercial and recreational. So commercial landings have declined every year since 2010 uh, to uh, the lowest in the time series of around 800,000 pounds in 2020. Landings increased by 21% in 2021 to uh, 970,000 pounds, which uh, was the second lowest value in the time series. 2021 recreational landings are estimated at 5.2 million fish and 2.0 million pounds which is a 51% decrease in number of fish in fish weight 
from 2020. And Virginia was responsible for 36% of the 2021 recreational landings in numbers of fish, followed by North Carolina at 20%. Next slide, please. So in this figure, uh, the blue bars represent landings of Atlantic croaker in millions of fish, and the red bars are fish released alive, uh, both in millions of fish. And the black line is the percent of fish that were released out of the total catch. In 2021, anglers released 27.5 million fish, which was a slight decrease from the 31.8 million fish released in 2020. However, anglers released a greater percentage of the total recreational catch in 2021 compared to 2020, with an estimated 84% of total recreational croaker catch released in 2021, which is the highest percentage on record compared to 75% in 2020. Next slide, please. So for the PRT recommendations, uh, the PRT found no inconsistency among states with regards to the FMP requirements. Uh, the PRT recommends approval of the state compliance reports and de minimis status for New Jersey, Delaware, South Carolina, and Georgia commercial fisheries and the New Jersey and Delaware recreational fisheries. And additional research recommend monitoring recommendations can be found in the FMP review document. Um, some of those recommendations include research into impacts of climate change on the range of the species and research into Atlantic croaker juvenile discard mortality for the fisheries by each gear type in, in regions where removals are highest. So with that, next slide, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Tracy. Any questions on the FMP reviews? Lynn. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had one. Did I, did I hear you say on Red Drum that the um, Virginia uh, landings increased 84%? over the previous year yes can, yes from the previous be, year and this might be directed a little toward pat too can you tell if that's coming from the bay or the ocean or if what percentage of that is chesapeake and they were everywhere <laughs> yeah it's um it's there were a, you know more juveniles than we've ever seen i mean you know sub adults um there's much more targeting of the, of the bulls and the cows which is a catch and release uh, it's becoming more and more popular, and you know, the, you know, it's I I can speak from firsthand that the number that we were catching that year. Yeah, thanks. There's a definitely a high availability of uh, slot size red drum in the northern zone, at least North Carolina. And um, although they don't have a juvenile survey in Virginia, the juvenile survey in North Carolina has been above average uh, the last several years. So um, yeah, I was I. Personally, wasn't surprised uh, when when I saw the the the, the rec harvest increase uh, to the level they did in Virginia, North Carolina. So, uh, yeah, thanks thanks for that question. Any other questions, uh, Pat? Um, Trace, I just have one comment about uh, Table One with the regulations uh, for Virginia's commercial regulations. We open on the 15th of January, not the first. Okay, thanks, Pat. I'll okay, make that change. You. Erica Burgess. Thank you. Um, I wanted to request that the management change section for Florida be removed from the FMP review. Uh, it applies to the 2022 fishing year and not the 2021 year. So I don't think it's appropriate to include in there. And then when you move it to the next years, um, I have corrections in it for you. Okay, thanks, Erica. Um, let's see, from online, uh, Malcolm Rhodes. Try now, Malcolm. I think he might have hung up on himself. But I do have a one quick thing, if I may, Mr. Chair. Oh, yes. Go ahead, Tony. Um, Erica, sometimes if we know a state is going to have a future change, we do ask for um, 
in the compliance report, it asks for any changes that you think you're going to be making in your upcoming fishing year, and we do include that in the FMP review. We can make sure that it notes that it is for the 2022 fishing year, and then you can give us the corrections. But we do put uh, any upcoming changes that states know about in in the FMP review if it's available. Yeah, we didn't submit it in our compliance report because we were not sure what our commission was going to approve at the time. And I just don't want, even though it says 2022, it's in the 2021 report, things get confused moving into the future. I'd prefer it to be removed. Any additional questions? Okay, if not, um, looking for a motion to approve the FMP reviews. So, uh, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a motion. Do, do you want them Red Drum and, and Kroger together, or you want them separate? Separate? Yeah, yeah. They're, yeah they're separate. So. Okay. Uh, All right. So I'll make a motion to approve the Red Drum FMP review for the 2021 fishing year as amended today, state compliance reports, and de minimis uh, status for New Jersey and Delaware. Okay. Uh, motion by Lynn Fegley, second by Doug Hamans. Any any discussion on the motion? Let's see. Um, do we need to put in the as amended today in the motion for a drum? Oh, is, oh, okay. All right. All right. Um, is there any opposition to the motion? Okay. The motion passes unanimously. Um, so looking for a motion for the croaker of Marty Gary. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to offer the Croker motion. Move to approve the Atlantic Croker FMP review for the 2021 fishing year, state compliance reports, and de minimis status for New Jersey, Delaware, South Carolina, and Georgia commercial fisheries, and New Jersey and Delaware recreational fisheries. Thanks, Marty. Uh, second by Tom Foti. Any discussion on the motion? Any opposition in the motion? Okay, that motion also passes unanimously. So uh, yeah, thanks uh, for, for that. Okay, uh, next on the agenda is a progress update on the Black Drum Benchmark Stock Assessment. So I'll turn that over to Jeff Kipp. Jeff, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So yeah, I'll be providing just a quick progress update here on the next few slides on the ongoing 2022 Black Drum Benchmark Stock Assessment. Next slide, please, Maya. So the major milestone the SAS has completed since I last provided an update at the May meeting was the assessment workshop, which was held actually at this hotel two weeks ago, uh, July 18th through the 21st. The overall objective of this workshop was to review the results of various assessment methods developed since the methods workshop in February. Uh, some major topics covered during the workshop included finalizing our recommended stock indicator framework that will provide information on stock conditions between assessment years and selection of the uh, preferred assessment method and reference points to provide management advice. A few minor changes to the preferred assessment method were recommended during the workshop and the SAS won't be meeting a final time uh, on August 23rd via webinar to finalize the results. Next slide, please, Ma. So for our remaining scheduled, looking forward, we'll next hold an external peer review of the assessment in December and then deliver the results of the assessment to this board at the ASMFC winter meeting next year to be considered for management. And next slide, that concludes my, my update here and I can take any questions on the Black Drum stock assessment. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, any, any questions for Jeff on the Black Drum assessment? OK, 
Okay, seeing no questions, look forward to the results. As I mentioned last meeting, a bit busy time for stock assessments for, for the cyanides. I think all of them, uh, except speckled trout, are undergoing assessments, and speckled trout's undergoing assessments at the state level. So um, look forward to seeing all those results. Okay, next is uh, on the agenda is to elect a vice chair. So I'll look to Pat Gear to make a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Given that I served two terms as chairman and two terms as vice chair, I see no better person for this role as um, Mr. Doug Hamans from the great state of Georgia. Okay, so move to nominate Doug Hamans as vice chair of the Cyanids Management Board. Can I get a second? Spud Woodward. Any objection to the motion? I didn't think there would be. All right, so the motion passes unanimously. Uh, congratulations and thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. I'll try to keep us on task uh, in the next year and a half so I don't leave you too much more work than you're already going to have. So, all right, uh, we'll move on to other business. As I mentioned before, uh, Erica would uh, like to give an update on uh, red drum management uh, and rule changes in Florida. So, Eric, when, Erica, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. And I think. Uh, our new vice chair of the board is going to follow me on this. Um, a couple weeks ago, Florida approved new regulations for redfish. This is following the release of our 2020 stock assessment, which found that throughout most of our state, we assess um, red drum on, in, within three regions of the state, that it was meeting our management target of 40% escapement. However, it was not in the... Um, sorry, we assessed on four regions. Um, it was not in Southeast Florida, which is largely driven by the Indian River Lagoon and water quality issues within that area. Following the release of the assessment, we did 12 months of public engagement and rule development in which we learned that the public did not view the health of the fishery in the same positive light that the stock assessment did. And so we wanted to look at the fishery differently. So we have moved to a new form of management where we are evaluating the fishery with six metrics. We are continuing to evaluate it with escapement, which is our proxy for SPR. Um, we're looking at relative abundance, habitat, harmful algal blooms, fishing effort, and stakeholder feedback. And we're doing a quantitative and qualitative assessment of those six metrics to develop re management recommendations for now nine management regions within the state. And we thought that nine regions were appropriate because the fishery targets sub-adult fish within nearshore waters. And so for the Atlantic State's consideration, there are three regions. We have Northeast Florida, which is a little bit larger than our former Northeast management zone. Indian River Lagoon and Southeast Florida. We have reduced our bag limit in Northeast Florida from one fish to two fish. We've reduced our vessel limit from eight fish to four fish in that area. Within the uh, Indian River Lagoon, we've gone to catch and release only, and we'll be at that um, until we believe we can sustain a fishery with achieving our 40% escapement. And in Southeast Florida, we are at a one fish bag limit, two fish vessel limit. So all of those changes we believe remain in compliance because they're more conservative than what the FMP requires, but it is a big shift for us. And if anyone's interested in knowing more about it, let me know. We are, we are going to, in the future, apply the same approach to the management of snook and sea trout. Uh, thanks, Erica. Those are pretty pretty big changes uh, for, for management. Uh, I'll, take a couple, I'll take a couple questions. So, uh, Tom? Yeah, it's re really a lot more restrictive. And I wonder, well, do you expect an increase in the catch and release mortality? And will that, yeah, I always think about striped bass. We've gone that way, and all of a sudden we catch, we're killing more fish than we're, you know, we're so, keeping. So I don't know if we're going to have that same concern yet with red drum um, at 8% mortality, but we have seen for our snook fishery, which has very conservative regulations, that catch and release mortality does exceed harvest. Um, but we are having large increases in population in Florida, um, largest increases in the nation, and all of those folks coming down from the beautiful New England and Mid-Atlantic area want to go fishing, and our resources cannot necessarily support all the people who want to take a fish home. Yeah, th thanks. Uh, good, good question, Tom. Yeah, appreciate that, Erica. Uh, Marty Gary. 
Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Erica, for your um, your report out on what you're doing in Florida. And I'm one of those people that comes down. I was down three times uh, in the last year to southwest southwestern coast. And um, I first, I guess, a comment. Uh, I applaud you, you for how you've handled the complexity of the challenges there. Uh, my question is, could you expand just very briefly on the harmful algal bloom because that's just fascinating. I've, I've noticed that where we go when we come down, um, you know, that's that's an issue at times. Yeah, thank you, Marty. Um, red tide is the primary harmful algal bloom that we're looking at this time because we can directly link it to effects on the fishery. It produces that toxin that, that kills the fish. And in Southwest Florida from 2017 through 2019, we had almost a three year long red tide that caused major fish kills. We've experienced it in the panhandle as well. And so we're looking at changes in duration and frequency. We're seeing observed increases in both categories. And so um, we know it has effect on red drum populations, particularly because it occurs at the same time of year that we have our spawning aggregations off Southwest Florida. So we're monitoring um, those spawning aggregations as well as our inshore population recruitment to see um, how it might affect the fishery. Positive outcome, our fishery young of year surveys have not shown any long-term effects from that red tide on the populations, but we're fortunate because we do have about 20 years of data to inform us about long-term effects. Uh, we don't have it for all the coasts, but we do for um, much of Southwest. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate that, Erica. And yeah, I guess uh, just kind of in the interest of time, if anyone else has any uh, questions for Erica, definitely feel free to reach out to her uh, offline. Uh, Doug Hamans. And not a question for Erica, but if I could kind of trail along. So our, yes. our anglers in Georgia couldn't be outdone by either South Carolina or Florida. And so this past year, they've been pushing for a regulatory change for Red Drum, although our analyses don't show a strong need for it. We're bowing to the human dimension and are in the process of a regulatory change. I'll be introducing that to the Board of Natural Resources this month uh, with the goal of having a change effective for um, bag limit, uh, vessel limit, which we've never had before, and for a captain mate retention prohibition. Uh, and we hope to have those effective in January. Uh, I'm not at liberty to really go into what we're planning until I meet with the board. But anyway, so so Georgia is planning a change, and it's within the the plan limits as it is now. Thanks, Doug. And, yeah, appreciate that. And yeah, I mean, I guess if uh, things are finalized uh, for when we meet in February, if you want to brief the board on on that, like Erica did, that'd be great. So, uh, any other business to come before the signage board? Uh, Tom Foddy. Yeah, I'm we're seeing the algae blooms in the freshwater lakes like we've never seen before. But on a personal note, I've lived in my house since 1979. And when I moved in, I used to have to hire somebody. I live on a lagoon to basically raise my pilings because it was nine inches or 10 inches of ice every winter. And they would push the pilings up as the, the tide would come in and out. I would also find where my chairs went when they blew off the dock and because I got, didn't get out there in time because I could see the bottom of the lagoon. Well, I haven't seen ice like that since 1989 that's been that thick. The ice boats that are sitting up in um, Island Heights, which is a whole warehouse full of ice boats because that's what they used to do, has not moved on the bay in something like 15, 20 years. We also, I have not seen the bottom of my lagoon in the last eight years where I look at it and it's always a cloudy soup. So I get more menhaden up in my lagoon than I did before, but I don't see the bottom. and we're all going to experience that as we get warmer and warmer, and hopefully we don't get the red tides that you get in Florida. But yeah, it's a real concern. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Tom. Yeah, a uh, lot, lot of, lot of changes from habitat and climate level uh, along the entire coast. Um, so, all right, we'll see. No other business. Uh, I appreciate uh, the board's uh, time and uh, and work getting through the uh, the items today. Uh, and if there's no objections, uh, I'll uh, call the meeting adjourned. Thanks, everyone.